Hi, I'm Jeff Garrett, uh, and it's the 31st of March 2020, and today it's my real pleasure to be with Sebastian Escara. Sebastian is a Wharton MBA alum from 1993. He's a member of the Wharton Board of Overseers. He was formerly the chairman of the Wharton EMEA Board, and he's a proud Penn parent, in fact, a Wharton parent. Uh, in 2018, he was named chairman of the International Chamber of Commerce in Spain, and he currently serves as a board member of Melia Hotels International, where he was previously CEO. Um, very hard times in Spain, Sebastian. It's great to see you. Could you just begin by sharing with us your perspective on how the crisis is going in Spain, which now potentially looks like the global epicenter? Thank you, Jeff, and you're absolutely right. We are in the, in the middle of, uh, of the battle here in Spain, and we are facing a, a health and economic and a political uh, huge crisis. Uh, Spain, I would say, is another example of how not to handle uh, a pandemic in all three aspects. Uh, most governments have acted uh, late, not taking into account what they saw not only from China, but uh, sometimes from their nearest uh, neighbors. And in the case of Spain, the Spanish government disregarded all health officials' warnings uh, and not only allowed, but encouraged the demonstrations uh, for March uh, the 8th throughout uh, all over Spain, uh, claiming that the coronavirus crisis was under control and, have, uh, and there, there was no risk. Uh, 120,000 people took part in the demonstration in Madrid alone. Uh, it was totally irresponsible to prioritize political interest over the health of, uh, of the general public. Uh, another aspect is that there has been no coordination whatsoever between local and central governments, and this is not only happening in Spain. A clear example was uh, here in Mallorca on March 11th, in the middle of the crisis, over 3,000 Italian tourists were allowed to disembark in Palma for the whole day, uh, walking around the, the city without taking any preventive measures whatsoever. Um, one of the biggest problems, I would say, that has uh, happened in, in Spain is that uh, we have not carried out massive screening as the World Health Organization has been recommending from the very beginning and that have proven essential to detect and to isolate uh, the sick. Korea, Singapore, and Germany are clear examples of how effective massive screening is, while in Spain we are still waiting for proper tests to arrive. Actually, so, Sebastian, could I just ask you about that? Um, please. Is that, is that because uh, public health officials and the government chose not to test, or was it a shortage of tests in the country? It's a combination of both. At the beginning was precisely that pe uh, politicians didn't want to, to alert or to alarm, uh, to frighten the general public. Uh, and, uh, and then when they reacted, it was too late. And, and the market is uh, completely uh, saturated. Everybody is trying to get them, and it was too late. Uh, last week, finally, they... Uh, four weeks late, uh, some massive tests arrived to, to Spain, but the problem is that, unfortunately, they were faulty, as they were purchased through a non-licensed Chinese producer. So, as you can imagine, uh, this is really uh, crazy. We have, uh, as you were saying, one of the best public health services in the world, and the government have not uh, foreseen the threats in advance, even when uh, we, 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 Italy is just one hour away from here, from Mallorca, uh, and we had two weeks uh, seeing how the wave was coming here to Spain, and we didn't react on time at all. Um, one of the main uh, problems is precisely the medical and essential staff that are suffering the most the lack of protective uh, equipment to fight the disease uh, at the front line of this battle. And right now, 
these uh, medical and essential staff represent around 15% of the total number of people diagnosed uh, with uh, coronavirus. So this is uh, this is literally a tragedy, uh, obviously a, a unprecedented human tragedy. But you um, you're in the center of the industry, um, travel and lodging, which is arguably the most adversely affected by the crisis by a lack of mobility. Could you could you talk a little bit about about that, both at the industry level and then what your hotel group is is how it's faring, how you're planning to manage this? Um, for sure, Jeff. Uh, let me explain to you first why we are one of the most impacted in the, uh, industries in the world. Uh, the numbers of, uh, of how dramatic is the impact as well, and a little bit by regions. Um, hotels, cruises, and, and airlines will suffer the worst impact on this crisis because their services cannot be stored and sold later. Their losses are um, irrecoverable. Uh, they cannot be recovered. One hotel bed, one airline seat, one cruise uh, cabin uh, that is not sold one night is lost for good. Uh, while the fixed costs, such as uh, the building rentals, the, the aircraft, the, the plane uh, leasing, the mortgage repayments or amortizations and the overheads uh, are extremely high. During so, on that score, on, on that score, the the obviously there's an enormous issue in the United States, and I would imagine for you too, as to whether the people who work for you are also a fixed cost, right? So you're faced with the invidious decision of furloughing or laying off people and knowing that you're adversely affecting their lives versus trying to uh, minimize the damage, mitigate the damage with respect to, to your business. So how, how are you dealing with the people who work for you, who are obviously literally on the front lines for you on a daily basis? We are pushing uh, the different governments to try to, uh, to have uh, a temporary uh, layoff. That means it's not a layoff. It's your, the government will pay a next percentage of their salary, uh, sometimes it's 50%, sometimes it's 70% of their salary, uh, uh, the, and the company will pay uh, the rest sometimes, and, uh, and you are not laying off these people. You are just putting them aside. They are in their house, and they will come back as soon as the hotel is open. This is uh, um, what we, have, we are doing. Uh, in the different countries where uh, this, is, uh, uh, this has been allowed, and we are pushing for other countries uh, to, to be the fact, uh, and, and we are trying not to lay off uh, uh, any people. Uh, let me give you a couple of, uh, of figures of uh, how big is the impact, first in Spain and then worldwide, of, uh, of this uh, uh, travel and tourism crisis. In 2019, Tourism represented over 12% of Spain's uh, GDP and in excess of 14% of the national employment. Uh, Excel Tour, the Spanish tourism lobby that I chair for many years, estimates that 800,000 jobs will be lost in the industry this year and that the tourism GDP will decrease 32.5%. That means 55 billion euros when prediction for 2020 at the beginning of the year was a growth of plus 1.5 percent. Well, so could um, you put that in perspective compared, let's say, to 2008, 2009 or the other big crises that have affected uh, travel and tourism in the past? Absolutely. Uh, we were talking about that time. 3%, 4% decrease. Now we are talking about 32.5% decrease. So 10x, 10x the impact of the That's correct. crisis. That's correct. Uh, in Spain, the consensus among analysts is saying that the Spanish GDP will have losses of minus 5.5% in the GDP, rather than the expected plus 1.7% that was the estimation at the beginning of the year. 
So plus 1.7, we are moving to minus 5.5. But tourism will represent half of that drop. 46% of that drop will be coming just from our sector. That is amazing. And l- let me give you a couple of figures worldwide or in, in the States. Uh, travel and tourism is supporting one in 10 jobs around the world. That, mean, that means 320 million people are working in travel and tourism, generating 10.5% of the global GDP. And the World Travel and Tourism Council, that is uh, the main lobby, the 100 biggest uh, uh, airlines, ho- hospitality companies, cruises. I was uh, a, a founding member of, uh, of that of the WTTC. It's estimating that up to 75 million jobs are at immediate risk, 75 million. And the global economy stands to lose up to $2.1 trillion in 2020 in travel and tourism alone, $2.1 trillion. In Europe, we are estimating up to 10 million jobs are at risk. In Asia Pacific, it's the hardest part, 49 million. In US, Canada, Mexico, up to $570 billion and over 7 million jobs could be lost. Okay, so this is, this is an extraordinary crisis, uh, and clearly you have to ask governments to do two things. First, to try to flatten the curve and get and move past the public health crisis, but pr- provide these emergency measures to stabilize the economy and to, to keep people's livelihoods. At the company level, you know, you, you have to act independently of that. Of course, you have to lobby. What are you doing at, at, at your corporate level to manage through this unprecedented crisis? We're we're going through six um, um, main contingency pillars, but going back to to your main point, for me, it's essential that governments realize how we need to balance both aspects, the sanitary and economic um, crisis. Um, Philip uh, Thomas, uh, the professor of risk management at the University of Bristol, stated yesterday how the, the recession that will follow the pandemic may end up having a higher cost in human life, in number of deaths, than the pandemic itself. Yeah, this so is a we... profound point, right? Because we're talking about disadvantaged people whose health is going to be vulnerable as, as uh, a result of losing their economic livelihood. It's essential that we keep that in mind and that governments uh, react on time, massive taste and isolation. It's the the only way to attack the virus and with uh, the enough means and resources. But then we need to work heavily on the after the crisis and, and, and how to mitigate this economic burden. Otherwise, uh, the heat will be enormous. In Melia, we're working on six um, uh, contingency plans. Uh, let me name them very quickly, and we can go uh, on depth in any one of them if, if you want. The first one is the protection of the health and of customers and collaborators. We were lucky enough to have only 26 people, um, 15 uh, customers worldwide and 11 uh, cases uh, from uh, uh, from collaborators. Um, let me uh, say before how Melia, uh, it's a company, it's uh, actually the most sustainable hotel company in the world according to Standard & Poor's. We have 388 hotels in 42 countries with uh, 100,000 rooms and over 44,000 employees. So. 26 is well below the mean. The, the mean. Um, so this protection of the health was has always been the, the number one point. The second is liquidity. Um, over the past few years, the company have been working on plans to strengthen the balance sheet and secure liquidity and cash flow. And, and this has paid off. And right now we can say how without any income, uh, the company will uh, continue its activity until the end of the year. Uh, just bearing in mind that we cannot open any hotel uh, 
till, till the end, uh, the year end. So th that's good news. And on so, that, top, so that can... liquidity point, I mean, those two, I, I know you have six, uh, those two, uh, no surprise you went first with them, look after people and then uh, think about think about the balance sheet and the bottom line. Um, just in terms of scenario planning, uh, is there any chance that the European summer happens in the Mediterranean the way it traditionally would? I mean, July and August, I presume, are the biggest months. Uh, is there any chance that, that hotels and tourism will be coming back? And, and what would that look like? Can you ramp up immediately or would it have to be a, a pretty gradual process? We can ramp up immediately, but we think that this won't happen. Uh, we are in our basic scenario, we're counting more on 30-40% occupancy rates whenever this starts, hopefully in June. Uh, maybe even in in May, uh, we are and 30, 30 to forty percent because you don't because you think there'll be government imposed policy restrictions or because travellers are going to choose not to travel. Be, because both things and and because some markets will be either harder or later. Uh, this is a wave it started in China. We are op reopening now our hotels in China and in Asia. We learned a lot on uh, how to close those hotels rightly, how to negotiate with hotel owners, with suppliers from our experience in China and in Asia. And we have uh, gone through all this curve, learning curve. And, and, and right now in the Americas, for example, uh, most of, most of our hotels uh, are closed, but three, one in Lima, Lima, another in Caracas, and another in Vallarta, but all hotels in Cuba and the Dominican Republic, in Mexico, but Vallarta, um, uh, throughout uh, Central America, and most uh, uh, in Latin America, uh, have already been closed, um, sometimes anticipating. Um, so, the, the, this is actually our uh, the third main pillar, the, pro the prog progressive parallelization of activity. The fourth is the continuity in the activity through digital media. So all critical departments have been identified and they are working with, uh, with all the means and resources through digital media. The fifth is the identification of, and mitigation of contingencies uh, with uh, uh, with the supplier, with the hotel properties, with the strategic partners. We have open channels of communication to ensure we can quickly adapt to all possible contingencies. And the sixth point is what you were saying, the, the day after. Um, we are following an active and constructive dynamic that allows to identify the measures that we must have implemented to uh, the reactivation of our activity. We, this is already happening in Asia. Uh, and we are including in this, uh, in this day after the review of our strategic plan, of our operations in our corporate headquarters around the world, the review of our processes and, and purchasing standards of food and beverage, and the opening of our hotels when the crisis ends. And we are making sure that we are using the, what I, we call the zero, zero ink uh, of our activity. So we are reconsidering how we will do things in the future from the very beginning. Uh, these six points have been essential uh, and, and we're working, uh, my brother as uh, the current CEO and all, all his staff uh, are working on, on it. And we have taken measures on, on the six of them um, to make sure that, uh, that we are uh, working on it. On, and finally, with Melia, let me say how we have always uh, had a clear commitment with community. That's why uh, we have become the most sustainable hotel company in the world uh, through Standard & Poor's, uh, named uh, last year in 2019. And uh, especially at times of crisis, when it's time to give back to society, uh, we are keep on doing it. And the com with that commitment in mind, Melia has already converted four hotels to be medicalized and used as hospitals in Spain uh, for those patients who are recovering but still need uh, to be in isolation in order to free up uh, uh, hospital beds that are needed for new, uh, new ill people. And, uh, 
and, and we are off, and we have offered as, um, different hotels around the world to the different governments to, to keep on doing the, the same thing. So this is an incredible case study. I mean, you are, you are in the vortex of the crisis. Um, no, I, I know from you and from your company the commitment you've always had to sustainability, to compassion, and to being part of the community. So uh, I, I know you never, you never expected, no one could have expected uh, this situation to materialize, but you're clearly leading and, management, leading and managing in, a, in an exemplary way. Sebastian, thanks for all your time today. And uh, I hope to see you very soon. And I know that uh, the company uh, Spain and the global tourism and, uh, and hotels are in very good hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. It has been a pleasure to share some of uh, my views uh, with uh, the Wharton community, with all your students, and I wish uh, all of you the best. Let's hope that we will be wise enough to find equilibrium to fight this uh, health, economic, and political crisis, and that the humanity can learn the lesson as we have done throughout uh, history. I think that one of the, the good aspects uh, that um, uh, the good news that we have got from this crisis has been the effect our cut down of pollution it is having on planet Earth, which proves that we have the key to heal the damage we have done to our planet. Let's, uh, let's learn um, lessons and let's uh, hope that uh, companies have done the, the right thing in, in the prosperous time and, uh, and that they are strengthened right now to to be able to to, moti to mitigate the, this big, this huge hit. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you.